Great Britain and Scotland in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, we had things like private property, which we mentioned. So you get to uh, own your own stuff and keep the profits for it. So they have private property protections. We also have um, a lot more money available for a couple reasons. Um, one of them is, first of all, Europe at the time, they had discovered the New World, or at least connected it, and, and they had a lot of stuff that people around the world wanted, uh, like spices and tobacco and you know, p potatoes, tomatoes, all kinds of stuff. So most people in the world, in Europe and, and Asia and Africa, were willing to buy that stuff. So Europe was getting uh, rather wealthy. What we would say is their money supply increased. I gave you this example last week. Uh, if you guys all have $10 total, that's all you have, the odds you're gonna go at lunch, if all you have is $10 and just blow it all on one meal at Jack the Box, probably pretty low, because you guys don't have a lot of money. But if you had $1,000, what are the odds that some of you would go uh, spend $10 on lunch at in and out or whatever? Higher or lower? Yeah. Definitely higher, okay. So that's because you have, we have a higher money supply. If you guys all have $1,000, the money supply in this little economy in our room is higher, you're, you're more likely to buy stuff. So Europe, just because more people are buying their stuff that they're bringing into the new world, like tobacco and, 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 and sugar that they've cultivated and potatoes and things like that, they have a higher money supply. So people have more money uh, to spend in Europe now because they're getting wealthy off of it. All right, so uh, Europe starts to do really well. In fact, England, despite being much smaller and kind of late to the game, they really start taking off and becoming much more wealthy uh, than some of the other European states. So one of the guys that notices this and tries to explain it uh, is uh, the person we learned about yesterday, uh, Adam Smith, and he's going to illustrate his ideas uh, in the book, The Wealth of Nations. That's in 1776. So what is it that this guy uh, thinks is the reason why England, in particular, uh, is doing so well by 1776? Well, first of all, these guys in England, uh, and other parts of Europe, mostly uh, in England and Scotland, uh, they begin to trust individuals to run their own lives. Trusted. Right, that's why you have natural rights, the enlightenment, all that. We don't trust people uh, in a higher class just because they're born there. We trust individual people to make their own decisions. So like if they wanna go out and uh, try to sell you something and they fail, uh, well, they failed. If they succeed, well, well, great, they succeed. They trusted you uh, to kind of control your own life and move up and down the hierarchy on your own, not, not just being fixed based on birth. So he was very uh, much a believer that individuals should be trusted with this. As such, he doesn't think that individuals should be restricted on what they do, all right? So who was, uh, who was restricting what you could or couldn't do um, maybe in the Middle Ages or before the uh, uh, 1700s? Craft guilds. Yeah, craft guilds, absolutely. So some limitations came from guilds, uh, and you could also say the state as they're kind of part of that, or some states would impose tariffs so you wouldn't buy things from other people. I need my sheets so I can give you some more regards to that. Okay, cool. So the reason why they had tariffs before was, we'll, we'll give an example here. Let's say you've got England and you've got uh, France. All right, uh, not a lot of cows in England. It's uh, much colder in England, especially the further north you go. Uh, so you would, uh, if you go to England to get cheese, there's not as many options available. All right, so if there's less cheese available, what happens to the price of that cheese? Is it gonna go up or down? Uh, it's gonna go up, right. So let's, uh, let's pretend it's 1776, and if I wanna buy a, whatever you buy cheese in, a cheese wheel, I don't know, uh, back then, let's say a cheese wheel is um, $10, okay? Um, France, though, way more room for cows, all right? They're uh, a bit warmer, they have more pasture, so there's way more cows, which means they have way more cheese, which means the price of cheese is going to be? Lower, lower. nice, cool. Cheese, <clears throat> five bucks. All right, so if I'm a poor peasant in England and I don't make very much money, am I gonna buy English cheese or French cheese? Duh, because it's cheaper. I get twice as much, the same amount of money. Maybe it even tastes better, too, because these guys have more, uh, and they've used it more, and they've, they've tried different things. All right, so I want to buy that cheese for cheap. But um, before Adam Smith, the government in England didn't want you to buy 
anything from France. Why wouldn't they want you to buy anything from France? Yeah, they believed that there was a, a, only a certain amount of money in the world. So if I'm spending money and giving it to another country, what happens to my country's wealth? It goes down, it goes down right. So they were big believers in that whole uh, mercantilism idea, which believed in fixed wealth. Like there's only so much money that exists in the world. All right, but he's going to develop a theory that shows that that's not actually true. All right, so back in the day, England would say, well, we don't want you to buy French cheese, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a tariff on it. All right, so we're gonna put a tariff, meaning all cheese coming in from France now costs 10 more dollars. So if I'm a, a peasant over here in uh, England and I go to buy French cheese, it goes from $5 to $15. Now I can't buy it. I've gotta buy my really expensive British cheese, right, because they, They've made the price of French cheese so much higher. All right, who suffers from that uh, tariff? Just the peasants. You're totally right. The peasants do, right? Because instead of being able to buy twice as much cheese, they, they can only buy the ten dollar cheese or the really expensive French cheese. So the peasants definitely suffer because they can buy less. When? Who else suffers? France. Why does France suffer? They don't get any money. Yeah, they're not selling stuff now, right? So now they're cheese sellers are less happy because now they sell less cheese as well. All right, so it's kind of like everybody loses. All right, I can understand the fear because uh, England's like, well, we're just losing money to France. Why the hell do we want to do that? But here, let me ask you this. Do you think maybe that there's something that England has that they could sell to France that France might not have or only has a little bit of? Probably, all right, and they do. Uh, well, we can pick a random one. Let's just say lumber uh, or coal or iron or whatever. France has much less of those things than England does. But so let's say coal, all right? Because coal you can use to burn for a furnace, and later on they use it for machinery and stuff like that. So let's say, and this is true, there's way more coal in England than there is in France. It's going to be cheaper, right? And if you're in France, you need the coal or lumber, whatever it is, uh, to heat your home and later run your machines and all that stuff. All right, so coal here per pound is like, I don't know, 10 bucks. But in France, there's not much of it. So coal over here is 20 bucks. What Adam Smith's gonna point out is, okay, yeah, France might have better cheese. And so all the cheese makers here in England, ah, they are gonna have a hard time, all right? But is that the only thing that they can do in the entire world to make money is to make cheese? What else could they do maybe? They could maybe mine coal, exactly, right? So what Adam Smith suggested was, and we'll talk more about this next week, we should get rid of these tariff things because it makes it too expensive for people. It makes the peasants unhappy because they gotta pay twice as much for cheese, and it makes the uh, sellers of cheese in France unhappy because they can sell less. What we should do instead is say, no, no, no. We'll get rid of this tariff thing, all right? That means you can sell the cheap cheese to France so the peasants are happy because they get cheap cheese. The uh, sellers of uh, cheese in France are happy because they get more business. Who's unhappy though? Who in England would be unhappy about these uh, this cheap cheese coming over? The cheese makers over here in uh, Britain, they'd be sad. But guess what? Like we mentioned, they're not just stuck only making cheese for the rest of their lives. What could they do instead? Mine coal or, or something else that the French would want to buy, right? So yeah, they'd be temporarily unhappy, but they shipped over here to uh, mine coal then they'll be nice and happy because France is definitely gonna be buying plenty of that, all right? So that's what Smith suggests. He says tariffs actually make your life worse because you can buy less things. What you should do instead is just accept the fact that certain countries can make things better than you can. So you should focus on buying that from them for cheap so you can get twice as much and just selling them the stuff that they need, all right? That's the idea behind free trade. We'll talk more about that next year, but, or next week. But he says, we need to start getting rid of these things that limit what people can do and buy. So we need to get rid of things like tariffs, all right? Because that frees up more money for people. Because now, if I'm a peasant, if I buy $5 cheese instead of $10 cheese, I got five bucks left. I can buy something else. I can buy uh, you know, at least half a pound of coal or, or something else. I got twice as much buying power uh, because my cheese supply from France is much cheaper. So if I reduce the price of things, people save money. And if they save money, what are they gonna do with that extra money they have? They could save it, but they're gonna spend it too. Right. And why is it good if they're spending their money? What's that? 
it, yeah, it goes back to the economy, right? That money's going to somebody else, right? Somebody who's selling them something else, essentially. Okay, so what, what Smith is gonna find out, what the world's gonna find out is, if you start getting rid of some of these controls like tariffs, it actually makes people's lives better because they can buy more stuff. And yeah, sure, you have some temporarily unhappy cheese makers in uh, Britain, or maybe coal makers in France, <clears throat> but when they focus on the things they can make well, everyone benefits because you actually can buy more things that way. All right, so that's a good reason to get rid of tariffs, which he does suggest to do in his book. All right, why would I want to get rid of guilds though? What do guilds do that make my economy worse? Restrict creativity. Okay, they, they definitely restrict creativity, correct. Okay, cool. So guilds are definitely restrictive. And what I mean by that is, well, they could determine who we was even in the industry. If I want to be a bread maker, they could just say no. And if I, they, even if they let me in, I'd have to make bread the way that they said to make bread and have to sell at the price that they said to sell it at. Uh, so I didn't have a whole lot of freedom, all right? So uh, these guilds are definitely gonna limit people. And that's, of course, going to limit what they can do. And it's gonna limit innovation, all right? That's why we have like kind of this flat line uh, in the Middle Ages as far as like population growth and uh, uh, the amount of wealth people had because they weren't really allowed to change anything. So it pretty much all stayed the same. And as a result, for like over a thousand years, you have this flat line of population growth and this flat line of amount of money they made. Uh, but Smith figures something out. He figures out that um, there's not actually a fixed amount of money in the world. You can actually create money. We did that last week a little bit, or at least I think I showed you that last week. Didn't I show you how we actually banks create money? Yeah. How do banks create money? Anybody remember what it was called? Multiplier. The multiplier effect. Yeah, I gave you money for that one for sure. Okay, how does the multiplier effect uh, create money? Um, the banks take money, like say if I had $100, I'd put it in the bank. And yep. They give the same $100 to someone else, but mm -hmm. then they both have yeah, we do, right? So if I loan out money and they spend it and somebody else puts it back in, I, I just double the amount of money that's available. Uh, exactly right. So he's gonna discover there's two ways to create uh, money. Like you can actually just make yourself richer, uh, or at least your economy richer, without like, you know, stealing from other countries, which is what all of mercantilism was based on. So the two ways he figures out you can make money are number one, um, through loans, right? And we know that now is the multiplier effect. All right, and that's what we did last week. That's the one where like, oh, if somebody deposits $100, there's $100 in the bank in their account, but then the bank doesn't just sit there with that money. What does the bank do with it? It doesn't just give it away. It loans it, right. So it loans it to somebody else, they spend money on something, that person deposits it in, and all of a sudden that $100 just turned into $200, right? Banks actually create money and create wealth that way. So loans create money, uh, wealth. Here's the other way, labor creates money. All right, so what are they doing uh, on farms now? What's happening to farms uh, in England uh, at about that time and just before it? Enclosure movement, right? Private property, they're closing people off. So what were the peasants doing on it before when it was common land? They were working it, right? Yeah. But were they getting wealthy off of it? No. Why not? Yeah, it just went back in the form of taxes to their lord and or king, right? So no one was making money off of their work, all right? But why is it going to be different during uh, the private property and enclosure movement? What, what's, their, what's their work doing now when they're working on that land? They get paid for their labor, exactly. So labor actually creates money, whereas before that was just kind of the rent you paid and that would just sit with the lord and the king. Uh, now it's different, though. Now... When I go and work, somebody actually gives me money for that. Like, I'm actually creating money out of thin air by doing that, right? Because I'm not really doing anything except for, you know, harvesting a, a food in this case. Technically, you're creating the food, I guess. Uh, but instead of having people pay their rent that way and just having that be the de facto way to live, they're going to actually pay you for your labor, all right? And that's actually uh, quite an innovation because now, uh, through loans and labor, I can actually increase the amount of money everybody in my economy has. And we all know this, when you get money, yes, you will save some of it, but you're also gonna spend more of it, all right? So what he ends up uh, sort of devising here 
is a system that's not fixed, like there's only a certain amount of money in the world, it's like no, that amount of money keeps going up and up and up as loans go out and as people uh, are paid for their labor. So instead of having a fixed wealth system, we have sort of a wealth creation system. And what I mean by that is this, as long as people are getting more money through loans or they're being paid for their labor, it's going to start the cycle uh, that builds the economy. All right, so here's money coming into the economy. When I say it's coming in, I mean these two factors, loans for people to buy things or labor as they're being paid for their labor. All right, so here's how it starts. You uh, get a loan or you work for your labor, you have more money, all right? Again, what do people do when they have more money? Spend they spend it. it, right. So they buy more things. That's cool, but uh, if I'm a store and I'm selling you, I don't know, or let's just use In-N-Out, because I keep using that example and it's new over there anyway. Uh, In-N-Out, if I keep getting more and more customers, what's In-N-Out gonna have to do? Hire more employees. Okay, hire more employees. Yeah, they're gonna need to make more uh, burgers or fries, whatever the hell they're making. Right, they're gonna need to make more. So if you keep buying more from In-N-Out or wherever you're buying it for, they need to make more. They could raise the price, but they also need to make more because they don't have enough to go around. So to do that, they're going to hire more people or open up more stores or expand it or whatever, right? So they're going to uh, 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 make more. And as you already mentioned, if I'm gonna make more, I need to hire more people, right? So they're gonna hire more. Wait a second though. If I hire more people who didn't have jobs before, and now all of a sudden they have jobs, are they going to have more money? Yes. yes, they are. What are they going to do with that money? They're going to spend it, right? So this is that wealth creation uh, cycle that sort of grows itself. As you keep inserting money in, by giving out loans, people can buy cars and houses, land, things like that, or uh, paying people for their labor and they can work and get money, they're going to buy more stuff. And if people are buying more stuff, companies, are, they're, going to want, they're going to want to make more money, obviously. So they're going to make more. To do that, they have to hire more people. Oh, well, to hire more people, uh, that means they get the money. Now they have more and they buy more. So it starts that cycle going and going and going. Uh, and as the cycle goes and goes and goes, more people get money, more people get the stuff they need, and you'll find that over time, things get cheaper. Because the more you make, uh, the cheaper the prices get because more of it's available. All right, so that's what Adam Smith uh, ends up doing. And I realize that was kind of a all over the place as far as how I was explaining it. But he's going to argue that we should get rid of things that make things expensive, like tariffs, because you can buy less, and get rid of guilds that limit what you can do and what prices you can set, because what you want to do is free people up to do what they, uh, uh, what they want to be able to do. Uh, and you should allow them to use loans and use their own labor uh, to get money and buy more things. That actually starts this wealth creation cycle instead of slowing it down. All right? So, how would we summarize all of this? Because that was a lot. Let's start with, before I show you the slide, what is it called? when people in an economy have more money. What, what, what's raised? What goes up? So if you all have more money, I would say you have a higher what? Standard of living. Okay, you would definitely have a higher standard of living. But if there's just more money in the economy, money supply, higher money supply, cool. So, uh, who said that, was it you? Yes, that was, I gave you more bucks for that. Higher money supply, that's good. Um, what's going to incentivize people to want to uh, make money? They work for themselves, cool. And because of this concept, they're able to make their own money when they make stuff. So what's the concept that uh, I have my own things, so if I sell it, I get the money? It's an incentive, yeah, but like why? Are they getting it in England and nowhere else at the time? What's there that means if I make something, I get the money for it? Private property, right. Okay, 
I have those two things in England. So then Adam Smith starts to think about why uh, they're making so much money. So his theory is we should get rid of something to make everything cheaper for people. What are they supposed to get rid of? Tariffs. Yeah, they want to get rid of tariffs. Okay. Cool. If prices are lower, people are more or less likely to buy it. They're more likely to buy it. Absolutely. So he's like, nah, get rid of tariffs. It's better that that cheese is cheaper so you can buy it all. And it doesn't mean you're going to run out of money because even if you uh, buy all your cheese from France, what could you perhaps sell to France that they need? Yeah, coal or whatever it is your country has. Exactly. So you should be like not worried about, you know, one industry, your cheese industry failing. You should be more concerned about making sure you can buy cheap things from them and they can buy cheap things from you. Okay, cool. Um, what about, why were they so concerned with setting up tariffs before? Why was it that they wanted uh, you not to buy anything from anybody else? You were convinced there was only a certain amount. Exactly. They believe in the fixed wealth idea. That there's only a certain amount of money uh, in the world. But with these two developments happening in Europe, they find out that's not true. You can actually create your own money. You don't need to get more stuff. How can you create money? There's two ways to do it. Give me one of them if you can. Okay, cool. Loans, right? That multiplier effect. Loans, so the multiplier effect. That actually creates money out of thin air. Okay, what's another way you can create money? Labor. Yeah, being paid for your labor. Exactly, your time, your effort, your knowledge, your expertise. That you can be paid for. Okay, cool. And both of these allow you to uh, create wealth. All right. How does that creating, creating wealth system work then? So it starts with these two providing money to the economy. So people, individuals, have more money. What's my next step? They spend more. Cool. Or they buy more. We'll put they buy more. All right. If a, if, if a company is experiencing people buying a lot more stuff, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to make more. All right, and to make more, they're gonna to have to do what? Hire more people. Oh, and if I hire more people who didn't have jobs before, they have what? More money, right? And that just keeps that cycle going. So he sort of lays out the groundwork uh, and it kind of explains why England's becoming more successful than others. Because as they develop private property and their money supply increase, and they begin to slowly get rid of tariffs uh, and get rid of guilds that limit what you can and can't do and the prices you can set, it allows these two factors to flourish and allows people to become wealthy uh, on their own. All right, does that slightly make sense? I know it's super complicated because it totally is. All right, okay, cool. So that'll be the first slide or two. The purpose of guilds before was uh, because people were worried that people were too stupid uh, to run their own businesses, right? Because remember back then they didn't trust everyone to make their own decision they thought only certain people were smart enough to do that, right? People born into the nobility uh, or royalty or, or whatever, right? Anyone born in the lower classes were inherently stupid and inferior. They couldn't be trusted, all right? So as such, guilds were the only things trusted to determine what the price of a good should be and also to look at its quality because they were worried that you, uh, if you were a lower class person, were too stupid uh, to set a reasonable price uh, you would try to like gouge people or charge too much or whatever. Uh, and they also worried that you wouldn't make good enough product. That you had to have somebody else going, going, coming in and saying, oh yes, this is what the price should be and, and uh, this quality is uh, good enough or, or not good enough. All right. Adam Smith, though, throws this out. He actually says it's worse. This is, uh, this is very limited as far as what you can and can't do because you're having somebody tell you what to do. All right. What he suggests instead is you should let people choose what the price should be and let people choose what the quality. And he doesn't mean the person selling. Who does he mean should choose the price and the quality? The consumers, right. So he's a big believer, not in guilds determining what people should do, but individual choice of uh, the consumers, right, which is demand, people that want to buy stuff, and of course the uh, suppliers 
or the producers, they would say, which we know as the, uh, the suppliers. And here's what I mean. How would I know if a price is too high? Let's say I go out and I start a business and I want to sell um, shirts, I don't know, or jackets. How, how do I know my price is too high? Yeah, if nobody's buying it, right? It's very easy to, to figure that out. If I go out and try and sell jackets or shirts or whatever for $500, unless I'm some insanely well-known brand already and I'm known for that kind of high-quality, high-priced stuff, I have no chance in hell of selling those uh, shirts, at least enough to survive as a business, right? So if my price is too high, I'm going to know because if, if I set my price too high, I'm going to know because no one's going to buy it, right? How would I know if my price is too low, though? Everyone wants it. They might all want it anyway. How would I know the price is actually too low, though? Okay, you've got to make enough money, right? So if it costs me $100 to make the shirts, I can't sell them for any less than, well, $100 if I'm trying to make money, right? So that, that's, that's for sure. My production costs are, are a factor. Um, but besides that, like, obviously, there's a minimum amount I have to sell it for to make any money. If it costs me $100 to make a jacket and I sell it for less, I'm losing money. That's a terrible idea. I'll be out of business. All right, so besides that, though, what kind of lets me know from consumers if my price is too low? Let's say I have, I made 500 shirts, okay? And I sell them at $105 a piece. And they're, high, they're, they're really good shirts for whatever reason. They're comfortable, they look nice, they have the latest features in them, whatever it is, all right? How would I know that price is too low? Obviously it was too high, no one's buying it. So what's the opposite of no one buying it? Selling out, selling out yes. But not just selling out. Right, because if I let's say at hundred dollars, let's say at two hundred dollars, no. So I sell at five hundred dollars. The amount of people buying it is zero buying. If I sell it at two hundred and six dollars, that's a random price. Uh, equals I five hundred shirts, five hundred people buy it. Is that bad? I had five hundred. Five hundred people wanted to buy it. I should say want to buy. It. Is that a bad thing? I have 500, 500 people want it, they all buy it. Is anybody unhappy? No. Is that a problem? No, that's equilibrium. So my price is probably pretty good. Everyone that wanted one got one and I sold everything. All right? So this is what's called equilibrium, obviously. How would I know that uh, I'm, my price is too low? When people don't buy it. Yeah, when uh, more people when some people are left still wanting it but can't buy it. All right, so let's say at $105, 1,500 people want it. Can I sell that to 1,500 people? No, I can't, right. I can only sell 500, so how many people are gonna be left unhappy? A thousand, right, that's how I know my, my price is too low. Right, so how many of you want to buy, but I'm left over with a um, thousand left over. Well, we'll say a thousand unhappy people. Right, in that case, I know my price is too low. I need to raise it, all right? And that's how Smith believes you should determine, as a seller, what your price is. Read the market, see what they buy and don't buy, right? That's gonna take some time, for sure. Uh, but you should base that on the interaction between uh, the consumers uh, and yourself as to what they are willing to buy, because that's how you know what the price should be. That's too high, no one buys it. This is too low because there's a bunch of people that are left without it, that, that want it. This is a good price because it's selling about the same amount that I'm producing and then there's no one left unhappy about it. All right, uh, so that's one way he believes that prices should be determined. What else could affect this price? If this is just me and my business, what might disrupt this? So this is my business, uh, big, big shirts. That's what it's called, with a Z, even more annoying. Big shirts, what could disrupt big shirts flow of business? Competition, Competition absolutely. Now we've got huge shirts entering the business. I could probably sue them for being, make a similar name, but whatever. Huge shirts rolls in. They make the same shirt I do, but they sell theirs for two, no, $180. What's gonna to happen to me? 
you'll lose business. I'm gonna lose business, exactly. Right, because these people that, it's the exact same shirt, we're gonna pretend somehow. It's the exact same shirt, why would they pay 26 more dollars for it? Most of these guys are gonna come over here and buy it from huge shirts. Uh-oh, what am I gonna have to do with big shirts to make sure I don't lose all my customers or I keep enough to keep going? I'm gonna have to lower my price, right? So Smith points out there's two things that sort of control uh, price that you don't need a guild telling you what to do because people will tell you what the price should be based on what they buy. So there's two factors, obviously, demand and supply, but also com competition because if I have competitors, I have to win your money, essentially. That's the comp competitive element of it, all right? So if you're worried about somebody charging too much, that could happen if you only have one business. Because let's say, for example, huge shirts didn't exist, you all need clothes, could I jack my price up to higher than you're willing to pay? Yeah. I could, right? Because what are your options for shirts? Yeah. Just the one. I could take advantage of you, all right? But what prevents me from taking advantage of you is the presence of another seller. Uh-oh, now we have to compete for your business, all right? So this is how you win. I'm gonna have to get a really, really low price so that you want my shirt and not his shirt. And he's gonna have to do the same thing. So we're gonna be fighting to try to find a lower and lower and lower price. How do you all benefit from that? It's cheaper, right? Which means you have more money, correct? Because you're spending less, right? So you can buy other things. So that actually helps you out. What about quality? What if we have the same price, but uh, big shirts, uh, jackets break in like a week? What's gonna happen pretty quickly? Yeah, you're gonna lose all your customers. They're gonna be like, yeah, uh, my shirt just breaks in a week, right? The zipper just rips off or the button or whatever, you know? They're like, well, that sucks. The huge shirts ones don't. So all the business is gonna to go to huge shirts. So then big shirts here with their crappy jackets that break in a week, they got a choice. They can do two things. What could they do to win their customers back? Increase the quality, right? Make their jackets not suck. Or what else could they do? Drop the price. Be like, yeah, our quality's lower, but so is our price. Right, that's why, that's why, uh, that's why, uh, that's a terrible like pitch, but it's how it works, right? That's why, for example, if you go to get a meal uh, at McDonald's, it's going to be cheaper than a meal at Carl's Jr. How does Carl's Jr. stay afloat if they're twice as expensive? Yeah. Right, they, they, their, their pitch is more variety or quality, right? So that's, that's the kind of game that they're playing. Obviously, there's taste preference in there too, but uh, generally, they're, they're, they're touting that their ingredients are better or, or, or whatever, and that's why uh, the price is higher. So Smith says, we don't need guilds. In fact, guilds are bad because then you have no choice. If you have choice and competition, that's gonna make th both of these things, the price, it's gonna make the price as fair as it can be, and it's also gonna make the quality uh, as good as it's gonna be. Because if you go out as a business and you suck at what you do, you make bad shirts or you charge too much, you ain't gonna be making shirts very long. Right? Who's gonna be the only ones left over? The ones that are good or bad at making shirts? The ones that are good at it, right? So that's what his solution is uh, to uh, getting prices and quality to be optimal. Get rid of the crappy shirt sellers. They'll, they'll get rid of themselves because they're gonna fail. They'll make their crap shirts, no one buys them, they're gone. Or they charge too much, uh, they're gone. They don't advertise well enough, they're gone. All right, so that's his solution to it. So it sounds kind of harsh, obviously, because it means if I go into it and I suck, well, I'm probably gonna be out of that industry pretty quickly. But it does benefit you, the buyer, because if people are competing to try to win uh, your business, they're gonna have to offer you cheaper prices or better quality, or both, all right? So that maximizes the amount of money you have and it also maximizes the quality of the stuff that you get, all right? Now there's some complications we'll talk about later when like these businesses, okay, there's two of them, but what happens when this business buys that business? Or when these two businesses uh, work together? Could they work to screw you over by charging more lower in quality? Yeah, they could. Right, so that's a problem we'll talk about down the road, but initially, this is a wonderful idea that's automatically gonna make everything cheaper for you so you can buy more, and it's also gonna make uh, the quality better. And one element which I kind of didn't mention um, is like variety. Obviously, I can win your business by coming up with new ways, new jackets, new colors, new styles, right? That's the innovation uh, element they're adding to it. So if you allow people to do whatever they want to try to win your business, they're going to try to come up with new ways of bringing you in, making better jackets, better color jackets, better design jackets, finding a way to make the jacket cheaper so they can lower the price. 
uh, that's going to allow people the flexibility uh, to use innovation. Like I said, to either make the jacket cheaper or better in some way. All right, and that's how we all benefit um, in the long term from that. So essentially, all this comes down to he thinks competition will make sure you get what you need with good quality and better price and that guilds actually make things worse because if you don't have people competing they're not trying to lower the price because they don't care you're just going to go buy it from them no matter what they're not trying to make a, a new version or a better version because you're just going to buy their version no matter what because that's all there is all right so competition theoretically fixes or makes those issues a lot better does that make sense all right sweet uh let's last element i want to talk about is uh how they would choose people. So before, uh, guilds would choose people who could uh, join a particular uh, industry. But the uh, way Adam Smith believed you should choose people is, well, first of all, let anyone apply or try. Uh, but whether they succeed or fail should be what determines uh, who's in a particular field. So even by that is that whole competition element. If I really suck at sales, I'm going to be a bad salesman. Do you think I'm going to be able to keep doing that career? No, I'm going to get fired, I won't make money, whatever, I'm going to do something else, right? Find something else I'm good at. So rather than have somebody else decide who does or doesn't do something, you should let people try things. And what you'll find, and this is what's happened, is the people you want doing whatever job they're doing, whether it's selling something or teaching or uh, uh, creating cars or, 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 or building skyscrapers, whatever, you want people that are, number one, motivated, that enjoy doing it, but also you want people that are, are capable, good at what they do, intelligent at, at what they do. Because not everybody's equally uh, good at everything or equally motivated. So here's what I mean by that. If I wanted to be an accountant, I myself would be incredibly bored, all right? So would I be a uh, really good, uh, hard, dedicated worker? No. no, I would just basically do the minimum amount I could to not get fired, essentially. I'd go in and punch my numbers in, hate my day, uh, do everything I could to do as little as possible at my work, all right? But I chose teaching. I like teaching. Um, I try to be as good a teacher as I can. And so what that means is when I go home each day, maybe not every day, but most days, do you think that because I like teaching, I think about how I could have done something better? I definitely do. Do you think I would do that if I was an accountant? Hell no, because I don't give a crap about being an accountant. I just want to get out of there. All right, so what you'll find is when people are in an industry they naturally like, like it's one of their intrinsic interest, interests, you don't have to like motivate them, uh, they think about how to do things better on their own, and they try things. And so what they do is they go to work, they try something, they go, that went really well, I should do that, improve that, or oh, that, that really sucked, I need to change that. Uh, that allows people to think about it more uh, and basically try harder, so they'll try different things to make outcomes better. And that, that's a good thing, all right? So what Smith believed is, I don't need guilds telling me who should do something. I should let the market choose who does something. Meaning, if I go out and I suck at my job or I don't like my job or I'm not intelligent enough for my job or, or whatever, uh, I'm gonna fail, right? So that system sort of lets people who are good and motivated uh, float to the top of that industry, and they'll become the uh, best people who make the most money or do the best job or whatever. And if I suck or I'm not motivated at a job, I'm gonna fall down and out of that uh, uh, industry's hierarchy, right? Because again, if I'm a bad salesman or accountant, uh, I'm not gonna make my company any better. They might lose money, they'll fire me. I won't make money if I try my own business version of it. It'll sort of s sort itself out. So he believed we did not need guilds uh, to determine who was in an industry because the market does that. If you suck at it or you don't enjoy it, you're not gonna do well, you'll find your way out of the industry. If you are really motivated and enjoy it or you're good at it, you will float up and you will succeed uh, where other people's failed uh, and that'll keep you in that industry. So he says, let people choose and find out. Go for what they're good at or what they enjoy uh, and they'll, it'll sort itself out based on how well you do or don't do. Okay, and here's the one other big concern. So this was of course how to choose employees or people in the industry. Uh, don't let guilds do it. Let the market do it. Market chooses. And again, that means how good I am or how motivated I am determines, generally speaking, how well I do. If I don't do well, I ain't going to be in there much longer. The last concern, and this is that whole invisible hand concept, is, well, if we don't have guilds or smart people or nobles or wise people born in the upper classes choosing what to make, how do we know we'll have everything we need? That becomes a big issue, all right? 
but the market sort of determines that one for us as well. So here's an example. Do we have uh, the government require people to uh, invent a new medicine if a new disease pops up? Does the government have to force us to uh, go out and find a new cure for it? Why not? Why would people do it on their own? Because they do. So okay, okay, they are motivated to help people, absolutely. All right, that's one feature. It's a necessity, that's true. Money. The money, too. It's, it's going to be both, all right? Some people who don't like capitalism will paint it all as the profit. People that really like capitalism will paint it off because they want to help people. Realistically, it's a combination of both. Some people are more towards the greedy side. Some people more towards the want to help you side. But to say that it's not a mix of both and, and different people is, is just a lie. So here's what they believe. Get, people thought guilds or people who were higher up had to choose what to make because uh, we wouldn't have enough of what we need. Like, oh, we're not going to have enough houses or food or water or medicines. Like, no. If there's a need, like what we just mentioned, food, water, medicine, shelter, clothes, etc., someone is willing to make it for profit, right? To help you and to make profit. And that's the idea of the invisible hand. We don't need somebody uh, telling us what to make to provide for our needs. The invisible hand is going to uh, do that for us. And the invisible hand is essentially people's uh, desire uh, to help and profit. So again, let's pretend um, we have a shortage of water here in the valley. Uh-oh, do we need someone to tell us that uh, we need to uh, uh, save our water better or, or buy water from other states or channel water in desalination uh, uh, facilities at the, at the coast? Does somebody need to do that for us? No, why is it gonna happen on its own? Because we need it. So is there money to be made? There definitely is, so somebody will buy water from another state, or channel a river to us, or conserve more water, or set up a desalinization plant at the ocean, whatever it might be, uh, get more ground, dig for uh, wells for more groundwater, whatever it is, some person or company is gonna be willing to provide that need for us, which helps us, obviously, uh, because they benefit by profiting, all right? So that's the idea of the invisible hand. We don't need somebody telling us to provide us with water or provide us with medicine, because some person or company is gonna go do that anyway because they A, want to help you and or want to profit from it, all right? So we don't need people being required to do certain things. If there's a need, someone's gonna fulfill that need or even that want uh, to make profit off of it. That's the idea of invisible hand. So Adam Smith says, no governments, no guilds telling us what to do, what to sell, how much to sell it for, what, what quality. Let people choose, all right? And that's the interaction of the supply and demand that's competing with other businesses, and that's uh, uh, allowing people to provide needs uh, for that desire to help and that profit, all right? And that's a system that uh, definitely has some kinks and problems, which we'll talk about in later weeks, but it is ultimately a much, much, much better system for providing people with stuff, lots of things that they need to live, providing at a lower price, and increasing people's uh, standard of living. All right, uh, we have barely enough time.